When I was a child, my mother tells me that I decided at an incredibly early age that I wanted to go to Cambridge to read maths. Personally, I think this is probably apocryphal, but I do know that as soon as I got exposed to physics at school when I was about 13, I just loved it. My physics teacher undoubtedly, if she didn't inspire me, at least she enabled me to be inspired by the subject. When I was a, a student in Cambridge, I was having a, a very tough time because I'd actually done a different day level from everyone else. I was part of the pilot. And so I didn't know the stuff everyone else knew. And my director of studies at Girton, Christine McKee, sort of nurtured me, took care of me. And she herself was an academic woman, uh, sort of forging her way. I remember her telling me in the 50s how hard it was to get a job in academia and she'd obviously managed. In physics there are very, very few women, so I can't remember the percentage of female professors, there's now something like 8% in the United Kingdom. So I'm always going to be in a minority, I may be the only woman in the room. There are inevitably going to be high points and low points. For me, I think one of the high points was when I was made a professor. It was at a time when Cambridge still only appointed about 12 or 14 professors across the entire university each year, so it really was a big deal. Now we're much more in line with other universities and you know, it's much easier to become a professor. So that, that felt really quite startling and I was of course the first woman to be a professor in the physical sciences, so not just in physics but in chemistry and stuff as well. So that was a, a real high point. But bizarrely I think after that I began to hit some lows because it became apparent to me and I've heard other successful women say this, that actually mid-career is really tricky because you stop being a sweet little thing who men can patronise, if you like. And I was no longer just being a good bench scientist. I was having to um, make my way on committees and things. And that I found incredibly difficult when I was seen as perhaps a threat, but certainly as alien. I was different from other people. And it actually got quite difficult for me at that stage. I very much felt that I was not one of the boys, not fitting in. Um, there were various things that happened to me that I found very uncomfortable and a lot of my friends from other universities were saying why did I stay in Cambridge and I felt very strongly that I wanted to stay in Cambridge. I loved the place but also I felt that I had to be able to hack it here and it wasn't right to walk away and of course in due course things improved again. So when my children were born, um, I was I just got my lectureship. So I was actually pregnant when I took up my lectureship. So I didn't know it. I was so badly pregnant. And my husband had a fellowship. But there came a point when his fellowship money dried up. And so I had the permanent position. And so he stepped back and said, OK, he'd become the primary carer. And of course, what happened to him is what happens to so many women. It's really, really hard ever to get back. So he never has got back into academia. And that is very tough for a man to be the one who, you can't say he's the breadwinner or even you know, earning anything. It has been very hard for him, but it's what really made it possible for me. So that although when my children were small, for instance, I didn't travel, I was very careful to be around a lot. Nevertheless, I knew he was the one who was there to pick up the children from school and all those necessary things. So it's been tough for him. Outside my work, I'm fairly narrow, I fear. When I was younger, music was hugely important to me. And as a child, as a teenager, I both sang and played the viola, and that was hugely important. But once I had children, there was no time to do that. And I very consciously sort of walked away. And it, it's perhaps in the last 10 years I've come back to it and this year my husband and I have actually bought tickets for a series of concerts, that's a real turnaround but um, I find it quite hard to switch off. I mean I do read a lot, I read a lot of sort of scientific biographies and things like that rather than pure fiction but that, that I guess is my relaxation. But one of the things I'm doing a lot of now that's not, it's not either work or relaxation in a way, it's somewhere in between, is I do a lot of writing and I'm blogging now um, and I really love that. I, the ability to write, I mean creative writing is the wrong phrase but it's not the dry words that you would use in a scientific paper. It's, it is giving me the chance to be much freer about the kinds of things I write about and I write about things like um, 
my experiences, which I think people find quite illuminating, but I do have to be careful not to give too much away. When I look in the mirror, I think increasingly I see my mother's face because I look as I remember her looking and I realise that I'm getting old. <laughs> it's very depressing, you know. I enjoy my life and I realise that I'm just going to get increasingly creaky and arthritic and all the rest of it. It's kind of sad because I still, internally, I feel about 25. I still feel I have all that energy and passion and yet the reality is it's not like that anymore. It's a bit sad. Thank you.